All right. So once again, hello everyone, and welcome to today's online workshop. Today's topic is what is SEO? Um, SEO is short for Search Engine Optimization. Um, so I'm Ben. Nice to meet you all again. I recognize some people, uh, but it looks like we have some new people here joining my session as well. So good to have you. Um, I live in Japan. <clears throat> I've lived in Japan for over 30 years. Um, I've been a WordPress user um, since 2014, so um, about eight years or so now. Um, I initially started just building sites for myself and my church and like different community projects. Um, but then a couple of years ago, um, I started working as customer support for WordPress. And that's when I really got to dive into WordPress and understand how it works. And then this year, I've joined the training team in the WordPress project, and I am here to create education resources like these online workshops, and also to help other volunteers um, so that they can create educational resources like this as well. Um, so I enjoy helping people with WordPress. And if you're interested in hosting these workshops, um, do get in touch and I can tell you, I can share with you how you can get involved also. Um, Anyway, um, just some um, ground rules about um, online workshops. These online workshops are intended as a space for us to learn together. So you can ask questions at any time. Um, the Zoom chat, I have that open, I'll be monitoring that. Um, and I don't have to be the one answering questions either. So if you know the answer to a question somebody else asked, go ahead and add that to the Zoom chat and hopefully we can all um, learn from each other through these sessions. Um, just as a reminder, the sessions are recorded and they will be uploaded to WordPress.tv um, so that people who couldn't make this session can also see the content. And yeah, once again, if you're interested in hosting these workshops, I can show you um, how you can get involved also. Um, and yeah, hi Sue. Um, Sue from Life Ring Secular Recovery. So thank you for joining us. Okay, so I have another question I want to ask people. Um, how familiar are you with SEO? So one is I've never heard of it before. And today is the very first time I'm hearing about SEO. And then 10 is I'm an SEO specialist and I work with SEO every single day. Maybe you help client websites get better SEO. Um, so in a one to 10, where would you say you are? <clears throat> Right, we have an eight, a three, a two, four or five, three, a three, six or seven, eight-ish. Wonderful. So a good spread of um, experiences here. Four or five. No one has said one yet. So it seems like we've all heard of SEO before, um, but maybe we're not exactly sure how it applies to our own sites. Um, and so, I myself, I think I'm a, maybe a seven or so, six or seven. Um, so it, it looks like there are people here who might even know more than me. So um, do join in in the chat. And if you have information you can share or even information you can add to what's in my slides, um, I'd be happy for you to join. <laughs> Which reminds me, um, I do have my slides and I usually share this with folks. So let me get the link for that. <clears throat> All right, today's slides. Um, so I'm going to go through these slides um, on the screen here. Uh, but if you want to go back a few slides to see what I said, or um, and if you want to um, click on the links in the slides, I've just shared those in the Zoom chat here. Um, and they'll be available after the session as well. So if you just want to focus on the presentation, you can come back and check those slides later. Right. So generally, how do people find our blogs or websites? Um, I say blog here, but the same thing applies to websites. How do people find us? Um, and I think there are mainly two methods people find us by. First one is through search engine results, like Google and Bing. Um, in Japan, we still have Yahoo. Um, and then there's everything else. So word of mouth, maybe people see your website address on a flyer. Um, 
maybe they're just subscribed so they don't even go through the search engines. Um, so people come to our sites through two different doors. Um, and today we're going to be talking about talking about people coming to our site through search engine results. Um, if you're interested in all the other methods people join our site or come to our site, I did do a online workshop recently. Um, I've left the link there in the slides. Um, ideas for getting more views on your blog. So if you're interested in that aspect of getting more visitors, do check that presentation out also. Um, but today we're going to be looking at people who come through search engine results. So I've broken my talk down into four chapters. And the first one is how do search engines work exactly? So in able to optimize for search engines, we need to know how search engines work. The second is what is SEO and why is it important? Uh, thirdly, what can I do to make sure my site is ready for search engines? This will be our biggest topic today. And I have, I think almost 10 different things you can do um, to improve your SEO on your website. And finally, as a bonus, um, I'll be introducing just briefly a couple of other types of SEO, um, which you can look into further after this session. Um, so yeah, before we jump into the content, did anybody have any questions so far? Anything they wanted to get off their chest before we start? Doesn't look like it. We're all ready to dive in. Cool. Okay, so how do search engines work exactly? Um, so um, search engines send bots to your site. And I have a little character here, um, pretend this is the search engine bot. And they don't actually look this cute, they're just programs. But um, search engines send these robots, or oh, send these bots to different websites um, to check out these websites, what is the content about, where do they link to, um, almost like a person looking at a website, not exactly the same, um, but they do come to websites and crawl. Um, so we use the word crawl here to say people look through your website um, to pick out information from it. So bots um, come to your website and the main thing is they click through links on your site. Um, so that helps them navigate through your entire site, look at all your pages and all your posts. Um, so links are really important to help bots through your site. Um, and as a bot looks through your site, it figures out keywords for your site. So in this example here, this site is looking at this pink, uh, sorry, this bot is looking at this pink site and it goes, all right, so this site looks like it's a store selling clothing. And then it looks at like the descriptions of the different products and it says, okay, I'm, I'm seeing the word cute and modern appear a lot of times in these descriptions. Um, and then it looks at the site footer and says, ah, oh, the store says it's in Sydney, Australia. And so uh, what a bot is doing is when it's looking at your site, it's trying to pick out the different keywords here. Um, you can't say this is the keywords for this site. You can't really specify these are my keywords. The bot's going to come look through your site and figure out what the keywords are on its own. But anyway, um, once it figures out what the keywords are for your site, it then records those in the search engine database. So in this example, um, this bot connects this pink site to the word store, clothing, cute, modern, Sydney um, in the database. So now if anybody, so whenever somebody starts a search query um, and they look up different words, Google and the search engines aren't exactly traveling all through the world looking at all the websites to find, to find what's going to be a close match. What it's doing is it's just looking at its own database and all the data it already has stored there to figure out what might be the best result for this person's query. So in this case, if this woman here is searching for modern clothing stores in Sydney, um, the bot looks at the database, it goes, okay, I found a store that matches most of the words. This, this woman hasn't specifically searched for cute, which was also in the database, but that's okay. The bot's going to try and find results that are um, closest to what this person is looking for, and then recommend that in search results. So that is an 
overview of how search engines operate. One other thing I did want to point out is um, search engines keep, look, look for keywords. They travel through links. They look for keywords. That's one of the most important things they look at. Um, but there are other aspects of your site search engines are looking at. And they sort of give your site a score. And sites with a higher score, they are going to rank higher in search engine results. So for example, um, different things as bot will look into. Um, what other sites do you link to? Um, so what external sites is your website linking out to? And then also looks at who is linking back to your site. So it can't collect that information from your site directly, but as it travels through other websites in the world, it's keeping a note of how many people are linking back to your site. And if those sites out there are credible, um, if they're just, it's a, so their score, of those sites linking back to you, their score and your score are sort of interconnected here in a sense. Something else bots are looking at are the images and videos on your site. What are these images about? Um, it's also looking to see if your site loads quickly. Um, does the layout look good on mobile devices as well? So not just desktop, but in, in a vertical mobile screen, is the site looking okay? Um, is the site secure? Does it have um, a secure certificate on the domain? Um, these, these are just some of the other aspects a bot is looking at when it gives your site a score in its database. All right, so let me pause there. Does anybody have any questions so far about just generally how search engines work? I have I had one question about um, linking. Um, how important like is HTML or like um, that type of tagging in that result when there's when the the bot searching initially? So you mean like HTML tags in your links specifically? Well, just in the website itself, like how it's coded. Okay. Because I my understanding is SEO does like you know. H1, H2, P tag, button maybe. Yep. And it also has like accessibility, right? So that yep. has something to do with ranking as well, correct? Yes. Um, my understanding is, so you're talking about the structure of say pages and posts and the headings and the paragraph tags. Um, and my understanding is yes, it does look at that. So for example, um, headings should be in order. So you should have one, h1 tag and then you have h2s under that and then h3 should be nested inside the h2 um if you had like multiple h1 tags or if these heading levels weren't nested correctly then the search engine is going to say that's a miss like a badly formed site and give you a lower score so um what you're saying is important the, the tags you use in the structure of your page is definitely important um, and there's also another type of tag called meta tags, uh, which we will talk about a bit further. So I think there are two types of HTML tags here, the content tags, which as you say are important, and then meta tags, which we'll look in a moment. Uh, but yeah, great question, thank you. So we have a few people drop things in the chat here. M says, bots also try to navigate the overall page content to understand what it is about, so if the heading structure doesn't make sense, that lowers your ranking. Oh, great. So that's, that's the same as what I just said here. So it is looking at your structure. And if it doesn't make sense, it lowers your ranking. Um, Jean says, 15 years ago, we were told to mutually exchange links with other sites. So our sites would have more link backs. All right. So that's talking about this second point here, um, which other sites link back to you. Um, so search engines have evolved a lot since 15 years ago um so there were at the time different like companies not companies out there but you could pay money and then they would put links to your site in a lot of places and so you were sort of buying those link backs um search engines are smart enough now to pretty much identify when you've purchased links like that um so if you're if you're doing that like paying for link backs, um, that's actually going to negatively affect your SEO rank. Um, 
So what you want to do is build those link backs organically. Um, and I'll talk a bit later about how you can actually do that. Um, so like sharing your links with your friends and asking them to link back to you, I think that's still a very um, good way to create link backs. Um, but paying for those link backs um, or using dodgy services out there who say they can raise your SEO ranking if you pay them a certain amount, you, we should be avoiding those. We should be growing these links organically. All right, and, and you say credibility counts, yes. All right, so now that we know the overall structure of how search engines work, um, let's just take a moment to review what is SEO and why is it important? So um, I brought this over from Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia says search engine optimization, SEO, is the process of improving the quality and quantity of website traffic to a website or web page from search engines. So it's improving the quality of people who come to your site through search engines, and it improves the quantity of people who come to your site through search engines. Now, when you say quality, there are a few aspects to this. So first of all, there are bots out there who are just traveling the internet doing bad stuff. You don't want those to come to your site, really. Um, what you want are people who are interested. There are also people out there who click on the search engine result, take two seconds to look at your page and decide it's not worth them staying, so they go back to search engine results. Um, and those people sort of don't stay very long. And so what you want to do is you want to improve your site so that people stay longer on your website. And th that's another aspect of raising the quality of visitors the quality of website traffic to your website. Um, SEO is performed because a website will receive more visitors from a search engine when websites rank higher on the search engine results page. So even if you just look back to your experience using search engine results, you generally don't click into the fifth and the sixth and the seventh search engine result page. If you don't find something on the first page or maybe the second page, then you'll probably change your search query and look, try and figure out a better word to look for what you're, to find what you're looking for. Um, and so it's important that our sites end up on the very first page of search engine results, um, or like the top three results even. And the higher we get in search engine results, the higher chance we have of people seeing our site and landing there. Um, and so this is like important for business websites. If you have a a business website or a store or a brand you're trying to promote, um, working on SEO is definitely important. Um, and even if you have a private blog, um, there are small, simple things you can do to improve your SEO score, even just a little. And if you continue to work on that, you don't have to spend tons of time. But if you can slowly improve your SEO, then gradually you should expect to see more people come and visit your site. Um, so why is SEO important to me? Um, if you rank high in search results, you will most likely get more visitors to your site and your story or your website or your business will reach more people. And that's really why we have websites on the internet because we want to reach people with our brand or with our product or with, our, with the story we post on our blog. Um, so SEO is important for every type of website, I think. That's all I wanted to say about SEO. Did anybody have anything else to add as to why SEO might be important or any thoughts you might have about that? Nope. All right. So now let's jump into the juicy part of today's workshop. <clears throat> what can I do to make sure my site is ready for search engines? And we're going to look through quite a few things here. Um, I might pause after each point, after each point um, so we can ask questions and share information because we are going to go through a lot of stuff here. Um, so visibility settings, blogging frequency, content quality, keywords, linking, metadata, site maps, excerpts versus full posts and other technical factors. So first of all, the most important thing you can do for SEO is make sure your site is visible to the internet. Um, 
So often when we create a new site, we might turn on a um, construction in progress type page. So when people visit your domain, they don't see your website yet while you're still working on it. They see like a, a landing page. Um, and so whenever you launch your website, just make sure you've turned that plugin setting off, that your site is actually visible. WordPress also comes with a built-in search engine visibility setting. So I've left a screenshot here. If you go to settings and then reading and then scroll to the bottom, there's a setting here called search engine visibility. If this is ticked, you are discouraging search engines from indexing your site. So if that is ticked, then it's most likely you're not going to show up in search engine results. So um, it's okay to tick that while you're working on your site initially, but once you've launched your site, make sure this setting is off because we want your site to be visible. All right. Um, that's all I had about this point. Did anybody have any questions or comments about this? You can also, I believe, enable that for single pages when working on those. Ah, you mean like the privacy setting within the page? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, oops, let me see if I can. There we go. Let me see if I can just launch a site quickly to show people what we're talking about there. Um, so let's see if you add a new page. Oops, there's something showing at the top there. Let's, let me just turn this plugin off so it doesn't bother us. Deactivate, activate. All right. So what you were talking about there is if you make a new page over here, under page settings, under status and visibility, um, we have public. If you click on that, you can change that to private. Um, and if you do that, only site admins and editors can see the page. So search that way the bots it. won't index it, right? Correct, correct. While it's private, um, they won't be able to see the content. Um, so yeah, that's what you can do for individual pages and posts. If you're gonna use this setting though, make sure you turn it back to public because it can be easy to forget to change this setting again. So just always make sure it's public once you're ready for search engines to index it. Yep. Any other questions or points? All right. So that's that's the very first point. Oh, okay. M has sent us a bit of information. Bots can still see a private page. They just won't include it in their search results. So M, are you saying they can see the existence of the page or they can can they also see the content of the page? Depends on how, okay, how the page is made private. Because now that you mention it, like people who aren't an admin can still access the URL of a page. If this is set to private, people can still access the URL and they'll say, this page is private. So people know that page exists. They just won't be able to see the content. Um, M says, it depends on the theme. Okay, so private pages, so the good thing is, so what we want to remember is um, bots can still, still see private pages. They can still see they exist, but whether they'll include it in the search results, um, but they just want to include it in search results. All right. Thank you for that information. All right. The next one is blogging frequency. Um, and Search engines generally like sites with fresh content. So if a site hasn't been updated for five years, um, but there's another site with just as high an SEO score and it's always putting up new content, then that new site, that, con that site with new content is probably going to rank higher in search results rather than that site that's just been left alone for five years. Um, so, there isn't like a magic number here. It's not like you need to blog every second day to make sure you get to the top of search results. Um, it's important that you have a frequency 
that you stick to. So if it's a private blog, depending on what your frequency is, um, just try and just keep consistent with that. And the other reason why I bring up blogging frequency is if you have a business website, it's, it's easy to let your website just go stale. Um, so like if your products don't change that often or um, there might not be a need to update your homepage regularly, even in those situations, it's still advised that you set up a blog page on your site so that your site consistently has new content and that will um, help improve the SEO score. Um, so you could blog <clears throat> um, maybe about your products um, every time you have a new product, maybe publish a post about that. Um, maybe the history behind your product or the history behind your brand. Um, so you can find different topics like this. Um, but yeah, what I wanted to say was even if you have a business website, it's still a good idea to have a blog where you have new content coming up regularly. All right, any questions about that point? And M says, the way you write content also matters. That is important. And that comes to our next point, content quality. So when, when search engines look at your site and look at your content, they are looking at the quality of content as well. Um, so Google recently, I think in the last year or two, published a EAT guideline. Um, and what this is, is it's saying search engines look at the expertise of your site, uh, of your content, the authority of your content, and the trustworthiness of your content. So expertise means, are you an expert in whatever you're writing about? Um, um, authority is, do you have authority to be talking about what you're writing about? Um, and then trustworthiness is, is the information you're sharing true? Like, is it, can people really believe what you're writing about? Um, so it, the, um, a way to increase your expertise, I guess, is to really study about that field, um, publish multiple posts about that content that people engage with and appreciate. Um, authority. Um, so for example, we all, um, respect say university professors that talk about a field they're really knowledgeable about um, and so generally university professors have authority in that sense um, but you do your posts have authority as well one one way a search engine might look at that is do other people link back to your to your content do they find authority in what you're writing and introduce your content on their sites um, so for example, when you link to other content as well, you want to make sure you're linking to content that has authority, um, content written by people with expertise, um, rather than just any old blog on the internet. Um, we want to be looking at the EAT of the con other content we link to, um, because that will, um, in a sense, connect to our SEO ranking also. And then trustworthiness um, is the information we're sharing trustworthy. So like, are you just writing things or do you have references you're bringing information from? Um, for example, in my slide before, I had the link to Wikipedia and I said, this is what Wikipedia says. And then I sort of talked about that. Um, you can do the same thing with your content, website content as well. Link to some other resource um, to make sure your data is trustworthy and then write more content about that, adding your thoughts and your perspective and sharing that with people. Another thing is um, when looking at the quality of your site, is your content shareable? So if lots and lots of people are sharing your content and linking to your content, search engines will generally think that must be good quality. It's not the only thing that determines quality, but it is another aspect. Do other people share your content? And that's why. Um, for example, viral YouTube videos come up higher in YouTube search results um, because the more people share it, the more people are watching it, Google thinks it must be good quality content. And so they raise it in the search results. Um, and the same thing can be said about your site. So when you write something, is it, is it funny? Does it have good taste? Is it catchy? 
Is it what your audience is looking for? Is it something they will then share on their social media or share on their sites? Um, this is just another aspect to keep in mind to make sure you're always publishing good quality content. So Sean, you comment here, we encourage our clients to share new articles relating to their field on their blog page. For example, an insurance agent would add new information about changes in insurance to their blog page for their site. Yeah, so that's, let's see, so that's sort of combining the blogging frequency we talked about a moment ago and content quality. Um, so uh, let's see, you talk here, uh, an insurance agent would add new content about insurance to their site because they're an insurance agent. If they, if they started posting about homemade cookies, then you're like, but they're an insurance agent. Like, why, why do they have expertise in homemade cookies? Um, so, so sticking to a field and publishing about that field helps you create quality content. On the other hand, if you're a, a, a chef or a cook, or um, you just have a food blog, you like to share food uh, stuff on, then blogging about homemade cookies is definitely a good topic you can go with on, the, on that side. Um, and this is another, this is a reason why some people have multiple blogs or multiple sites. If they're an ex, if they have expertise in multiple fields, rather than sort of jumbling them all into one site, um, some people just create different separate sites for each of those fields, um, which helps them, um, help search engines understand what the expertise of each site is. Thank you for the example, Sean. M says, reading level also matters. If it's too complex, viewers drop. Readers stay longer on content written in plain language, search engines noted. Right, so that's probably like, if you write an academic paper on your blog, then only academic people are going to be able to read it and stay on it. Whereas if you write whatever you're talking about in plain language, then even the average person will find that interesting stay there. And M, I think um, search engines tend to like longer articles because people stay there. But if it gets too long, um, then I think that's a, that's a bad thing for search engine score as well, SEO score as well. I think, yeah, um, if somebody else knows a bit about that, you can write that. I think I've heard before, Longer articles are better, but if it's too long and like takes an hour to read, then it would be better if it's sort of split into a couple of posts maybe so people can um, read it in shorter amounts of times. Ethan says TLDR. TLDR is short for too long, didn't read. And so Ethan, I think you're commenting, having a TLDR at the top of the post saying, this is what this post is about um, also helps. Um, so people don't have to read through all the text to figure out what it's all about. Is that, is that what you're meaning here? While we wait for Ethan, M says, it is good to create a summary section with a long article so people can scan if wanted or read entire article. And Ethan says, yes. All right, so we think you're both talking about a similar thing here. Um, I think in the last few years, we've noticed a lot more uh, web pages have like a table of content at the top, which are linked to the different headings in the post. Um, and me personally, I, I really like that because I can scan the headings and decide like what section I really want to read. And I've heard um, people with accessibility um, um, issues also use that. They can scan an article. And so rather than read like waiting to get through the whole article, waiting for their screen read to get through the whole article, they can skim through headings as well. Um, and so, yeah, longer articles are better for SEO score, but also have a way for people to skim through it and jump to the section they really need um, to improve their experience. M says, that is why headings are so important. Yep, M, you can jump through headings using a screen reader or other assistive technology. Right, okay. I'm, I'm glad we're all on the same page here. We all have similar information. Um, before I move on, was there any other question people wanted to ask before we jump into other topics? 
All right, next one is keywords. And keywords came up in how search engines view our site. So search engines scan through our site content to pick out keywords, which they then store in their database, which they use to present our sites in search results. Um, and so what this means is um, when you write the content on your site, you want to figure out what your audience is going to be looking for. Um, and for example, um, some parts of the world, they call tomato sauce, they say tomato sauce, and in other parts of the world, they say ketchup. Um, and so depending on your audience, you might want to write all your articles using tomato sauce, or you might want to say ketchup in everything you do. Um, if you start to mix those in your site, then it, um, search engines have a hard time deciding what the keyword is. If you're using different words to say the same thing, then it sort of reduces the impact of the keywords in your site. So um, when you make your site, figure out who your audience is going to be and what words do they use? What will they be typing into search engines to find your site? And then you want to use those words in your site content. Um, you want to use it naturally. You don't want to, it's called keyword stuffing. You don't want to like put tomato sauce everywhere on your site. Um, but where it comes naturally, you do want to add those keywords. Um, so there are a couple of tools out there that help you figure out what keywords people might be searching for. Um, many of them have a paid plan. Um, so I haven't been able to find a lot of good free tools, but WordStream is um, an example of a free um, keyword search tool. What you would do here is you would type in the domain of a, another site that has similar content to what you're presenting. So you would type the domain of a similar blog or a similar company or um, a rival company's website even. And then this would give you a hint of what words they use, or what words people use to search for content on that site. Um, so for example, um, B Sun's blog, this is my personal blog. So for example, if you're gonna start a new blog and you find my blog is similar to yours, um, you would type my blog domain in to see what keywords people use to search for my blog. <clears throat> so let's just see what happens here. So there are a few settings you can change here. I'll leave that as is for the moment. All right, so we have here, let's see, one of the most prominent keywords people use <clears throat> to search for my content is life work, or work community, or work life. Um, I do talk about work life balance on my site a bit. Um, and so this is probably why that sort of popped up as a keyword here. Um, I, I'm also a community manager. <clears throat> and so that's why we have manage or manager um, or community come in the top here. So um, you, you start to see a, a trend here of what people use to search for my blog. And that gives you a hint. Do you want to use similar keywords on your site to compete with that, that site? Or are there other words you can use that aren't getting picked up here? Um, which will give you like a, a, an advantage over that website. So there, there are two ways to think of it. Do you want to attack using the same keywords and sort of climb above the opposition? Or do you want to use separate keywords so that you find a unique niche to your audience and use those keywords to rise in search engine results? Um, so Keyword research, uh, we could almost do a whole online workshop about that as well. So I'll leave that for the moment. I just want to say, um, where would you use your keywords? So keywords, first of all, in your... Oh. Google ads, right? They have kind of a keyword planner too, which is free a free tool. Google ads, did you say? Yeah, they have like a, a you know, they'll have a keyword planner in there, I believe. Oh, okay. Used it before. There we go. Um, my browser is in Japanese is why you're seeing that. Let's see, here we go. Choose. All right, so you're, you're seeing it in Japanese because I'm in Japan, but this is the link um, 
Let me drop that in the chat here for people. Everyone in the meeting. Um, it's more for like generating Google ads, but it will help you on some keywords. Okay. Well, that's great to know. Um, I'll add that to my slides for future presentations as well. We have Google Ads Keyword Planner. All right. So where would you use keywords? First of all, your site title. Um, choose whatever is going to be your main keyword. And if you can include that in your site title, that'd be really good. Um, include it in your tagline at least. So WordPress has a tagline setting. You want to um, add your most prominent keyword in your tagline. Um, and then you can add keywords to your page and post titles. Search engines will sort of prioritize what your content is titled when they decide keywords. Um, you can then use keywords in your excerpts, in your content headings, and then in the content itself. So this is generally the priority in which you want to use keywords. Um, but whatever you do, don't, don't keyword stuff. So like, don't put five and six and seven keywords all in your tagline. Um, because that will come across as unnatural. You want to find um, just natural places where you can use these keywords and then stick to the same keywords across your whole site. All right. I'm looking at the time here. There is a bit more I want to get through. So I might move on to the next slide. If you have questions, drop them in the Zoom chat and we'll get to them a bit later. All right, so linking, we did talk about this a bit already. So I'll keep it brief. Um, First of all, search engines travel through the links on your site to understand the structure of your site and to look at more content. So um, if you publish a post, try and think about how you can link back to similar posts already on your site. Um, if you can create these internal links on your site, um, that, that helps search engines understand what content on your site is important, um, what posts or pages might have more authority, um, et cetera. Um, and also when you link to external sites, try and choose sites that follow the EAT guidelines of quality content. So don't just link to any site, have, have a quick look to see if it really is an authoritative site. Um, does it have trustworthy information? Um, and make sure it does come up with a good EAT score, even in your own mind. Um, and that will also give credibility to your links to them. Um, so linking is important. Um, we also briefly talked about HTML tags at the very beginning of this session. And I wanted to bring up metadata. Um, metadata is data on your website that generally people won't see, but search engines will see. So it's sort of, hidden behind the scenes a bit, but it does give critical information about your site to search engines. Um, and specifically, meta descriptions are, uh, is information shown in search results. So for example, if I search for um, homemade baking, let's see. All right, so you'll see these search results have a bit of a description here about the content of the of the page or the link. Um, and so this is um, meta description, and this is what sites use to show in search results. So um, I, I've listed at the last point here. Um, metadata is automatically generated by WordPress in many instances. So it's um, not that easy to edit it directly. But um, all the major SEO plugins out there do give you a way to edit this, to modify this metadata um, to gear it towards your site content more specifically. Um, so I've listed a few links here about different SEO plugins. Some of them have paid plans as well. Um, so what you can do on the free plan might be a bit different. Um, but one thing you can do is WordPress generally uses the excerpts of your pages and posts to create the meta descriptions. Um, so even without plugins, it's a good idea to hand write your post excerpts. If you don't write a post excerpt, it just takes the top paragraph or something from your content. But if you can actually hand write your post excerpts to include the keywords, um, 
then your keywords would show up here um, and search engines would have a better idea of what your content is really about. Um, so I have a question here. Um, what is the best character length for meta descriptions? Does somebody have the answer to that? Um, I do know if a meta description is too long, Google is just going to cut it. Um, oh, like this one here, this meta description here has dot, dot, dot at the end. I mean, it looks like Google has sort of chopped the description. So there is a length. Um, I don't know the specific number, but I think if you used an SEO plugin, they can help. Between okay, M says here. Did you say 70, Ethan? Yeah, I think it's like 50 and 70. 50 is like green light, and then over 70-ish is red light. You know what I mean? Like a Yoast right. plugin, for example. Yep. All right, and M thing says, M says, I think it cuts at 120 to 150. I think the number also depends on like desktop search results and mobile search results. Um, but yeah, you don't want to make these too long. Um, generally just a sentence or two um, will help. I hope that helps you, Sally, with your question. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, perfect. Another thing is a sitemap. So, Sitemaps don't boost search rankings, but they do help search engines navigate the content on your site. So they understand where your pages are, where your posts are. And lately, um, you can, search engines are also looking for, say, image sitemaps or video sitemaps. And so they're trying to find the multimedia content on your website as well. Um, most SEO plugins will generate a sitemap for you automatically. So it's not something you have to code yourself. Um, but I just wanted to note here that it is something search engines use. Um, so if you ever come across settings in your plugin about sitemaps, this is what the sitemap is. It, it's like a map to help a search engine figure out where all your content is on your website. All right. Now, um, this is an easier setting folks can edit on their WordPress websites. Um, on WordPress, depending on your theme, your theme might give you the option to show an expert, I'm sorry, an excerpt of your post or the full content of your post. So for example, on your blog page, you could show the full content of all your posts on the blog page, or you could limit it to just excerpts and then have a read more button. Um, and I've seen some people um, like to put their whole posts on their blog pages. Um, but the short answer is, it's best to just use excerpts. Um, you should just use excerpts and leave the full content of your posts to the post page itself. And there are a few reasons for this. Um, when a search engine looks through a site, if it finds identical content to another page on your site, it's, it can sometimes demote that as duplicate content. It will definitely demote it if you've copied content from another website, like entirely. If you've copied somebody else's web page entirely, then they'll look at which is newer and then it'll demote your content as duplicate content. Um, so um, it's a good idea to avoid having the exact same content in multiple locations on your website. Um, and also you want people to travel through your website and look at new content. So if you put all the post content on one page, they'll only ever visit that one page and they won't go exploring to other areas of your site. So um, keeping, um, post content to excerpts in different pages and asking people to come visit your post page is a better way um, to get engagement. It's better for SEO. And um, it also helps pages load quicker. Like a page that has to load hundred posts and all the post content is going to take a, a while to load. Um, so yeah, um, whenever possible, Keep it to excerpts and just keep the full post content on the post itself. Um, so I have a question here. Will there be a recording available after this session? Yes, there will be. There will be a recording available and I'll let you know in the meetup group when that is published. Um, all right, and I think I did have one more point now. Other technical factors that um, relate to SEO. So first of all, 
site speed is important. And um, Google in particular has become, um, they're viewing site speed more and more important when ranking pages in search results. Um, and it's sometimes difficult. Like if you live in a area with high internet speed, then even complicated websites tend to load very quickly. But what you want to consider is that there are people in the world who don't have as good an internet speed as you do. Um, people in developing countries might still have very slow um, broadband and um, you want your site to be able to load quickly, even for people like that. Um, so some aspect of site speed is determined by the host you use. Um, so looking to your host, um, there are different external sites out there that compare hosting speeds. Um, so see where your host ranks in, in those. Um, do, does your host have caching enabled? Um, you can enable caching on a plugin with a plugin, but if your host enables it on their hosting platform, caching can be a bit quicker that way. So um, we won't go into details, but that's something you can look at. Um, another thing you can look at is WordPress themes can sometimes change your loading speed drastically. Um, so some really snazzy themes um, might use like 10 plugins and it, it looks really nice, but on a slow internet connection, it takes for ages to load. Um, so try around with a few things. The visual representation is also always good, but also consider the, the speed a site loads when using that theme. And another thing to keep in mind is sometimes a theme on its own is fine or a plugin on its own is fine. But once you combine three plugins, it could change the, load, the loading speed of your site. Or if you combine a particular plugin with your theme, that can make your site load slower. So if you're finding your site is sort of loading a bit slowly, try and figure out when that started to happen. Was it after you installed a new plugin or was it after you changed themes or what, what that might be the cause there? Um, so Ethan here in the chat has been dropping us a few links about um, testing your site's loading speed. We have pagespeed.web.dev and also gtmetrics.com. I've used both of those in the past. And this will also give you what on your site is causing it to load slowly, um, which will give you a hint as to like, is it a plugin? Is it a theme? Is it the content? Is it your server? Um, those will give you hints there. M says images are usually the bandwidth hog. So compressing those help a lot with load speed. Yes, and that is the second point on my slide here. Images should be optimized. Um, images like, especially with the modern camera and the phones even, where you can take really high quality images. Um, so good that even people with the best monitors still don't need that high quality. Um, like people who are, looking on, who are looking at your site on their phone can very well make do with a very compressed version of your image. It doesn't have to be that good. Um, so optimizing images is important. And this last one isn't really much of an issue anymore. I think most hosts um, make sure your domain is secure. Um, oh, Ethan goes like this. Okay, well, maybe not all hosts. <laughs> um, but um, you'll notice a lot of websites now at the top here start with HTTPS. You can see my Google slides start with HTTPS. Make sure your site starts with HTTPS, with the S, the S for secure. If your site doesn't have the S there, then you'll want to look into issuing an SSL certificate for your domain to make sure your site is secure. And another thing about security is if your site has multiple admins, make sure everybody has a strong password to log into the WordPress dashboard. You can have the best security system on your site, but if your WordPress login password isn't strong, then people can easily log into your site that way or hack into your site that way and mess things up. Um, so make sure your WordPress login password is extremely good. Um, all right, and we have a few more points here in the chat. Um, EWWW plugin is my go-to for WebP. So that's an image type, I believe. Um, and then let's encrypt 
is a free SSL. So if you don't have SSL issued on your site, Let's Encrypt would help you get that for free. And then two FA, so two factor authentication. So when you log into your WordPress account, if you have two FA enabled, it means after you enter your password, it asks for like a login code or a, a message sent to your SMS or something. Just that second point of authentication before somebody can actually get into your site. Phew, that's a lot. Now, I do have a few more slides I want to get through. Um, so this session is going to run 10, 15 minutes late. If you have to cut out here, that's okay. The recording will be posted afterwards. But I just did want to let people know we are going to run a bit late because I think this is a really important topic and there's a, a bit more I want to share here. Let me pause. Any questions or anything you want me to explain once more before we move on? Sally, thank you for sharing your tips, favorite resources, very much appreciated. Yes. And um, those extra links, um, Ethan and Emmy, you've shared, I'm going to add those into my slides. So when I publish my slides later, you'll all have it in the slides then as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing. All right, so finally, we've been talking about SEL, search engine optimization, and I just wanted to conclude uh, with other types of SEO as well. And what I mean by other types of SEO is that we've been talking about general SEO. And more specifically, there's also something called image SEO, video SEO, local SEO, and multilingual SEO. And there might be more as well. Um, but I just want to briefly touch on what these other types of SEO are. Um, so, yeah. So first of all, image SEO is optimizing images so that they rank higher in search engine results. And what, what I mean by that is, for example, with Google, you can click on images and that takes your, your search query here and gives you image results. And so image SEO is setting up your images so that they rank higher in search results. And the reason you do that is because you want people to click on your image and come to your site. So images are another way for people to get to your site. Um, and uh, we talked about optimizing images before. Um, so images should be optimized. Image file names should be descriptive. Images should have alternative text set on them. There's a lot more we can go into here. So what I wanted to mention was I've actually scheduled an upcoming workshop just about image SEO. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about SEO, I'll be running the same session twice um, at different time zones on December 2nd and December 8th. Um, so do come and join us there and we'll talk all about optimizing your images for search engines. Tally has a question here. When naming an image, is it better to use dashes in between words or underlines? I would have to look into that. I, I don't think they are that different, but other people might know that. Let me take that back as a question to look into for this image SEO workshop. Ethan says alt text, A ALT, which is altern alternative text. Description is more what the search engine would see. Hmm, all right. Um, but I will look into that, like do dashes and underscores really have an impact? Um, that's an interesting question. Tally, you've seen both ways where you've been told dashes. Hmm, okay. Um, let's, let's see. Um, leave that with me. All right. So similarly, you have image SEO. Um, you also have video SEO. Video SEO is to help optimize your videos so that they rank higher in search engines. Um, and this, um, you can have like YouTube video SEO, which is like specifically YouTube to get your videos ranked high in YouTube. Um, but sometimes when you search for something, um, Google will also like just in general search results show videos here. Um, and so there are different things you can do to make sure your videos are highlighted higher in search results. Um, Again, we won't go into a lot of details here, but choosing a good video host, um, including a transcript 
So videos as a bot can look at transcripts, the text of a video much easier than they can decipher what's actually being said in the video. So including a transcript always helps with um, SEO purposes because bots can understand what the content is about better. Use an engaging thumbnail image um, and use keywords, again, keywords, what people are going to be searching for in the title and meta description. Ah, M. So why do we see videos in search results? M says that's because Google owns YouTube. Yes. Um, but in other parts of the world, Google isn't the main search engine. Um, so for places like that, you may want to consider what your main search engine is and how they show results, et cetera. But that would be anyway. a good thing, you know? like, okay, if I am targeting a Japanese audience, then, you know, because in, in the United States, we go, well, 80% of all searches are Google. Like, how yeah. would you think about that in an SEO term for Japanese audience? Yeah, um, it's a good question. In Japan, yeah, um, like in Japan, we have Yahoo search. But what I've heard is the J Japanese Yahoo actually draws on Google search. So Japan might not be a good example. Um, like places like Russia, they have their own search engine. Um, and China, um, they have their own search engine. Um, so there are a couple of countries like that. Um, but yeah, that, that is another point to look into. Um, Sally also says transcripts help with accessibility as people consume information in various ways. That is definitely right. Um, a lot of these SEO practices do overlap with accessibility practices. Um, so if you do SEO right, you're doing accessibility right as well, probably. Um, but accessibility is another interesting topic and um, it's on my list to get to someday in the near future. So maybe in the new year, we can have a whole session just about accessibility. All right, local SEO um, is optimizing your site to show higher in local search results. Um, so nowadays, when you do a search result, sometimes your search engine will ask you, can it use your current location? Um, and what that is saying is, it wants to look at where you are to give you search and, um, to give you results about, say, shops right near you, physically near you, um, or destinations physically near you. Um, and so some people don't like sharing their information, their location information, that's okay. Um, but some people do share their information. I am a, I'm a person who doesn't mind sharing my location with search engines. So I would share my location and then Google would try and give me local search results um, about places near me. And so this is something to keep in mind. If you have like a, a physical store, like a bread store, a flower store, then people on the other end of the world finding you in search results might not really help your business. You want to target people in your neighborhood or in your community. Um, and so there are a couple of things you can do to make sure you rank higher in those local search results. Um, one simple thing you can do is make sure your content information is in your footer or your widgets or your contact page. And when I say contact information, I mean your address, your physical address. Make sure that is there because search engines will pick up on that and say, oh, okay, this is a local store. So I want to give it in local search results. Another thing you can do is post localized content. So when you publish posts, post about events in your community, in your city or in your neighborhood or um, different maybe outreach activities you've done in that neighborhood. And if you have localized, a local content like that, search engines will pick up um, and give you a better local SEO ranking. And then also getting local backlinks. So having your neighborhood store link back to you or having um, another community next door link back to you. If you can have local sites link back to you as well, that will improve your local SEO. All right. Um, and then multilingual SEO. So local SEO is talking about geographic location, uh, like right near you. Multilingual is targeting different languages. Um, so if you have a website that is targeting like two or three or multiple languages, 
then you want to set up each section of your website to rank high in that community or that language's um, search results. So this really plays out in say keywords. So the keywords for this language um, might not be the best keywords in this second language. So you want to do keyword research, keyword research in each language individually to figure out how you're going to improve um, in that language. Um, so a few tips about multilingual SEO, um, include only one language in each of your web pages. If you start adding, uh, adding different languages in the same page is easy to create, but from an SEO perspective, it's not the best method. Um, so if you're really going to target um, SEO in different languages, you want to split out your web pages so that each page only has one language in it. Um, translate metadata as well. So we talked about that in data hidden behind the scenes that search engine see, you want to translate that to, so like the alt text on images. Um, you want to translate that information as well for each language. Um, Multilingual S, ah, uh, yes. So on this multilingual, like let's yep. say you have a bilingual website in, in what, French, Spanish, and English. Um, right. So you're saying include only one language in each page. Do you agree, should you translate like manually with uh, someone who speaks that language or are plugins like pretty accurate? Right. Um, so you'll see how I've listed a few plugins at the end there. Uh -huh. Plugins attack multilingual sites. Oh no, sorry, attack is in the right word. Plugins help you create multilingual sites in many different ways. So some plugins um, generate an automatic translation of your content. Other plugins um, just give you the framework and then you have to actually translate the content. Mm -hmm. There are other plugins that send your content out to translators and the translators manually translate your content and send it back. Um, so depending on the plugin you use, the method of translation is different. Um, I think the best is if you're fluent in that language, if you can actually translate the content yourself, that's going to be the cheapest and the best quality. Um, but not everybody can speak different languages fluently. Um, so then you'll want to look at the cost of these different translation services and um, what's going to be the best for your particular setup. Okay, so are you saying that then for SEO searches, they'll go into each page with a different language and then you'll rank in that language for those pages? Yeah. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, we talked about metadata a bit. Uh, yeah. One piece of information that's in the metadata is what language is used on that page. Um, so if the metadata says English, but your page has Spanish and French and English all in the one page, then that's going to confuse the search engine. Whereas if you make a separate page and each page in the metadata says this page is French, this page is Spanish, this page is English, then search engines will be able to pick up on that easier and target it for each language's search results. Um, and these multilingual plugins all help you set up the metadata um, pretty much automatically. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm just starting um, to do websites that are multiple languages. So this is very yep. interesting. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, again, do a Google search about multilingual SEO. If you search for multilingual SEO, you'll find a lot of other people who write content about this. And they'll give you hints as to what might be the best method for you. I don't think there's like one answer that fits everybody. Um, there are different ways of setting up a multilingual site. So do a bit of research and see what might be best for you. Um, all right, so just coming into the Zoom chat here to see if I've missed anything. Um, all right, so um, Sally says, there's an entire WordPress make accessibility team that can help when, when I do that presentation like on accessibility. Um, so yes, thank you very much for that information. Um, M says, the key is to use plain language in your content so that it translates easier. 
And there is a way to declare the overall language for the page, but you can also declare the language for sections or phrases. Oh, okay. So, and what you're talking about, there's probably the metadata. And usually in the top, it says what the whole page is, but you can, there is a way to specify what the language is for each section. I'm guessing plugins will help set that metadata up. Um, Jean says, great session. Thanks, Ben, and everyone else for the tips. All right. So, yes, that's been, um, what, 75 minutes? I hope it, you've learned new things from there. Thank you to everyone who contributed, all the links and information you shared. Um, I learned new stuff as well. Um, so if you want to connect with me, even after the session is over, if you're part of the WordPress Slack group, then you can click on this link here. You'll find me as Bitan Evans. Um, I am also on Twitter. Um, I started Twitter like just two or three months ago. So I'm not a Twitter pro, but I am on Twitter. So if you want to connect with me there, we can do that as well. And finally, the training team um, recently created a individual learner survey. And what this is, is we're trying to survey what everybody wants to learn about, how best you learn, um, what sort of resources, what sort of learning types work best for you. So if you have a moment, do fill out this um, individual learner survey for us, and that will help the training team as we create new content next year um, that you all, you all love and enjoy. All right, so thank you once again. Thank you, Ethan, for turning your video on and giving me feedback as well. Thank you, Em, for the information you sent. Um, and just thank you everyone for your engagement in this session. Once the recording's up, I'll let everybody know. Uh, but yeah, that's all for today. So have a great day or great evening. Bye.